Welcome to our day that we're going to be discussing philosophy and theology. In particular, we're going to be discussing Sankhya, which is a school of very early Indian thought. It's post-Vedic. We'll also be discussing its connections to yoga, which you may have heard of. You may have seen it all over the place. In fact, whether it's on TV or in your local strip mall, we'll also be looking at um, a school of thought called Advaita Vedanta, which is absolute non-dualism that posits that there is no difference between oneself and the ultimate state of being. And Tantra, which is not sacred sexuality, but argues that the very universe around us is the body of God, and we are ourselves a transformation of the body of God in a slower state. And finally, we'll end up with bhakti or devotionalism. So that'll be the main layout of our lectures today. Without further ado, let's get to it. And here we are. This gets going and we are ready. So, uh, as I said today, we're going to be discussing philosophy and theology. And what I wanted to do is start a little bit and tell you that we're going to be looking at, as I said, Sankhya Yoga, Advaita Vedanta, and Tantra, and Bhakti. Now, um, one thing is I keep saying that this is Hindu philosophy, but in fact, um, there is no such thing as Hinduism at this time. Hindu is a quite recent term, probably derived out of the Persian word Sind, having to do with the Sindhi River. And the Hindus would be the people of the Sindhu River Valley. So even when we're dealing with Persians, that's relatively late. Um, this, there's a term called Hindutva, which is a Sanskrit term, which means Hindu ness, but we don't see that in the Sanskrit literature in any way until recent times. So in the past, people would identify not with their school of philosophy per se, but whether they were, uh, whether what God they were associated with. Were they into Shivas or were they Shaivas? Are they into Krishna and Vishnu, Vaishnava Krishnaites? Are they Shaktas, into goddesses? Or were they non-Sanskritic folk that had sort of local or tribal deities? So that's how people would think of themselves. They wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as like a Sankhyan over anything else or an Advaita Vedanta over anything else. They identify with the deities that they are associated with, that they worship, and that their families are associated with. So one thing I want you to understand is with philosophy and Hinduism, philosophy is always debate. <clears throat> so in the earliest form of the text, the Rig Vedas, you have these like poetic compositions so, you know, one guy says, Rish Shabbat says this, but yeah, he's a pansy, and here's a better thing from Rish Shabbat instead of Rish Shabbat, and who knows when Kaikei comes on in. So they had kind of like almost an epic back and forth battle of poetic contest. Uh, a buddy of mine compares these to rap battles, which I think there's something associated to that. You know, if you want your Rishi to be talking about a sucker fly MC, there you go. It's, that's all Rick Veda for you. Now, the thing is, these poetic contests sort of gave way to debates. So in these debates, people would posit a philosophical position, and then they would try to debate and beat the other guy down. And if they won, they'd take all their followers, or they'd take over their land. So um, these, these philosophical comp competitions and debates are pretty serious. Now, toward the end of our Vedic period, we see a group called the Shramanas, or the, stri the Strivers. Now, these were the early Jains, the early Buddhists, and what they would do is they argued that um, death is not the end, that there is rebirth, but it is negative. They would say that heaven even is temporary. So even if you attain heaven, you're going to get reborn again in this world and go through the same process of getting old and dying and constantly suffering. The Jains said, you've already been everything and will be everything. You got to you are going to be miserable, so try to do as little amount of damage to the world as possible and remove as much action from yourself in order to strive towards being in a more comfortable state, which is a state of being nonviolent and not consuming a lot of things. So these folks also argued that release or nirvana, the extinguishing, or moksha, the liberation, was possible. Now, the proto-Hindus sort of had similar ideas on that, and we're going to talk about some of them in just a minute. And we're going to get on and do a whole thing on the shramanas coming up in further weeks. Now, the thing to remember about debates, we're going to see this coming up again, is if you win the debate, sometimes you become the head of the, the school the, of the person you're debating. Sometimes you take their monastery. Sometimes 
you get uh, a whole monastery given to you by the king that sponsored the debate. Sometimes even, supposedly, I don't know how often this happens, sometimes you get your the loser's head, that they would kill the person who loses. So these debates had a yeah, they're high stakes. All right, so debate. Um, it continues, and I've got a picture here of Tibetan Buddhist dancing. Well, they're not dancing, they're debating. They, uh, they say, they make a phrase, they make a proposition, and then they clap their hands together. And they'll say, that's not true. That does not pervade. Your logical argument does not work. So then they'll, they're constantly going back and forth and trying to catch each other in like sort of logical fallacies in order to sort of win these incredible contests. Uh, we will see a guy named uh, Shankara, who's the founder of Adelaika Vedanta. I like to call him Six-Gun Shankara, because in the 8th century, he wandered all over India, and he just took over monasteries by beating everyone in debate. And that's how Adwaita Vedanta, that we're going to hear about, was uh, became dominant. So the three trajectories we're going to look at today are yoga and samkhya, which we're going to look at together, then Adwaita Vedanta and tantra, and then we're going to look at bhakti. So let's start with yoga and Sankhya. Now, when I teach my yoga uh, classes, I, I find that people just go nuts for Sankhya because we talk about a lot about it. And, and it's really um, an enjoyable and elegant form of philosophy that marries itself well with yoga. Our pictures in the center, we have Kapila, who is supposedly the founder of, J of Sankhya, but we don't really know much about him. One of his texts survives called the Sankhya Karikas. And so the verses on Sankhya, which means something like enumeration, the verses on enumeration. But yet Sankhya lives on today because people still talk about Sankhya. And even in the yoga worlds today, people are thinking about Sankhya because if you could really, if you really want to understand early yoga, so like the fourth century stuff that comes from Patanjali, Patanjali is writing in the context of Sankhya. So we have Kapila in the center looking all tranquil. We have some white guy doing Padmasana, the lotus, uh, the lotus posture. And on the right, we have wacky white people doing something. I'm not sure. So in the history, we have Kapila, this guy, uh, and he has one text that survives, which is the Sankhya Karakas. We have mention of Kapila and of various types of Sankhya in other, in other texts, such as the Buddhists say, like, ah, the Sankhya say this. And the Jain says, oh, the Sankhya folks say this. And they enumerate different schools of Sankhya that we don't have the scriptures for by any means. They haven't survived. Or even the Ajivikas were sort of like nihilists. They, are, they have a lot of references to Sankhyas, uh, to Sankhya folks. The Mahabharata is filled. So the Mahabharata is the great Indian epic. It's the story of a colossal war. It's like uh, the Indian Iliad. So in there, we have a whole bunch of philosophical descriptions of different groups of Sankhya folk that we don't have any connection of. But what is this Sankhya? Well, it is absolute dualism. It says that there are two things that are in the world. You have Purusha and Prakriti, soul and nature. Purusha is the spectator. Purusha is the soul. It's the essence. It's the luminous state of the soul. But it identifies with Prakriti, which is nature that is completely insentient, that has no, it has no consciousness involved. It's just this constantly evolving, swirling thing. And as long as Purusha thinks it is actually in Prakriti or that it is enmeshed with Prakriti or it is Prakriti, Purusha suffers. Suffering is resolved when the soul can, or the spectator can be removed from nature or what is seen. So um, if, again, it's observer and observe, spectator and, spe and spectacle <laughs> for that matter. Um, all right. So there are no living exponents of Sankhya. Pictured here is Jerry Larson, the great Jerry Larson. He died just a little while ago. He was an Episcopalian minister, I believe, who was also did a PhD in like the 50s or 60s in Sankhya. And he wrote a bunch of wonderful books on the topic. And he was a, he was a, I, I took a couple of classes with him in Santa Barbara. And I remember he used to joke regularly and say, there's no living exponent of Sankhya except for me. I'm the only one. So he found it really connected with his Christian understanding of the world, this idea of Sankhya. So here is the last living exponent of Sankhya. May his memory be a blessing. Uh, all right, so when we're dealing with this, we gotta figure out what is Purusha and what is Prakriti. So I'm gonna go into some more details on this. So Purusha is pure awareness, pure conscious awareness. 
Um, there are an infinity of souls, and there are some arguments in there, if, if Purusha is singular, um, which is more of an Advaita Vedanta argument, or whether it is um, whether it is multiple, whether there are infinite amounts of Purushas that are out there in the world. Let's just stick with, there are infinite amounts of souls out there. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand is that we have this notion that like what goes on inside us and what goes on outside of us are separate. But Sankhya is a little different. They would say that you can see that you're different from the world around you, right? But it would say that within the skin, within your brain, within your emotions and your feelings, there, that is also physical. So what they would say is, and I, I have some, some uh, terminology here to use for you. So um, you have manas, which means usually mind in Sanskrit. Now what that does is it interprets sensory experiences. Then it jams that back to the buddhi, which is the thinking intellect. So you have sensory experience, goes to one organ in the brain, kind of, or in the soul, uh, well, not the soul, in the prakriti that's inside of you. And then the buddhi goes like, okay, all right, let's make, we got, we got that thing, and let me think some thoughts about it. And then it bops all the way back to the ahamkara, which is a great word, ahamkara, the one that does the I thing, the one that makes the me, the one that makes I. And the ahamkara says, okay, I figured all that out. So all of those things are thought to also be prakriti. So how does one escape this? Because the more and more Purusha feels its identification with Prakriti, it suffers, it hurts, it feels pain. And our, our goal here is to not feel pain, to not be suffering, to not be stuck in this world of constant transmigration. Um, liberation consists in realizing the truth of the soul is Purusha, who is essentially separate and always has been separate from Prakriti. They've never actually been connected. So what is this Prakriti? or nature, that thing that's, that thing that's put it, that's got itself put together, a thing that's evolved is a good meaning for prakriti. Well, uh, all sense objects and senses are prakriti. Prakriti is also all that stuff you see out there in the world. So how do we come to have a sensory experience? How does the mamnas and the buddhi and the ahankara get everything together? Well, this is really slick. Let's assume, let's just talk about the sense of the eyes. So your eye sense sends out a ray of light, and then it connects to the prakriti out there, and then it changes itself. It completely changes through what's called a sparsha when it touches the sensory object. Then that ray of light sort of comes back into the head, changed and altered, and molds itself to sort of your sensory faculties so you can experience that prakriti. So still when it's in your head, you're only, you're, you're seeing like a reflection of it from that sparsa that's come back from the senses. So it's complicated, but it's kind of elegant. Um, so another way to think of it is, and I think it's somewhat easier with, uh, with sound. Let's say, you know, sense ray of light, boom, out of your ears. And it's just boom, it's like pure consciousness kind of thing. It touches the sound waves and then it transforms itself to be like the sound waves and comes back and then that version of it molds in your head so you can understand things. So when you're experiencing nature and the soul experiences nature, it's experiencing one from the rays of light and then two within the head. But you're still only kind of really experiencing that ray of light. That, and all of that comes from that Rashmi, that ray of sensory ability contacting a thing. It's complicated, I know, but it's intriguing. It's worth thinking about. Now, the Sakyaites always like to say uh, that Purusha is like, uh, uh, is like a man with perfect sensory faculties, but he's crippled. And Prakriti is like a very powerful man who's blind and doesn't have any mental powers. And that's how they wander around in the world. You may, I don't know if you've ever seen Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, but over here is Master Blaster. Uh, who does run Barter Town, if you're familiar, the Mel Gibson, Tina Turner vehicle. But you'll see there that you have a giant man with great power, but he is as if blind and with no senses. And a tiny man atop who wanders about and controls him and does all the sensing. This is a perfect elucidation of the way that Sankhya folk describe Sankhya and the nature of Purusha and Prakriti. So liberation escape, moksha, and almost all of these Indian systems is nociological. 
So that's liberation through knowing, liberation through gnosis. So um, not only must there be a separation of the influence from outside and inside the skin, but the prakriti is in the skin, in the mind and motion must be separated. So when you're thinking about prakriti and you're finding your purusha, you'd be constantly sort of pulling things apart, seeing that you're not your thoughts, you're not your emotions, you're not your body, you're not your sense experiences, you're not this stuff out there. The idea is that when purusha completely stops identifying with prakriti, realize it's not out there in this world, and also realizing that all this stuff in there isn't Purusha either, it realizes that it is a complete, luminous, self-existing thing with no contact with Prakriti. And then they say the same thing, they use metaphors. They say, then the dancer leaves the stage. It's as if Prakriti, once it realizes, once Purusha realizes what Prakriti is, then Prakriti stops having value anymore. Then the question is, what are you looking at? The stage? The stage is pure being, I guess? I don't know. These ideas of liberation and moksha get a little, uh, a little mucky <laughs> when you start dealing with them. All right, so how do you get the world out there? Because we described the world inside us. Well, the world out there is composed of three gunas. Three gunas are qualities. And the idea is that what happens when the universe is created is that sattva, tamas, and rajas are in perfect balance. And then they start moving about. And the first thing they do is they emanate and create human consciousness. And after all the evolution of the different forms of human consciousness, then they emanate and create the rest of the world. Uh, here you see uh, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma uh, connected to these gunas, which I don't know if I quite buy. Um, but, well, let me just talk about them a little more briefly. These qualities, so sattva, which is pure light, rajas, which is movement, fieriness, and like, like action, and tamas, which is torpitude or sloth. We'll go into this in more detail. So the idea is that everything consists of these three qualities. And when you talk to people in India, they'll talk about a person being of a sattva character or a tamas character, or they'll talk about like, uh, or they'll talk about electricity as having a very sattva character as being very pure, but it's also rajas because it's always moving. Um, they'll talk about something that is tamas is like a rock or a drunkard person or um, something that's like, like, like really heavy fatty food. So they sort of, parse out the whole world based on these qualities. So to go into more detail, sattvas. Um, sattvas actually comes from the word being, sattva, beingness. And it is lucidity, purity, light, music. It's very subtle. Um, when we look to Ayurveda, uh, which uses these ideas of the gunas, it talks about different diets. So uh, a good sattva diet has seasonal fruits, whole grains, pure deli, no salt, no spice, um, I've gone places where I've lived on a sattva diet before, and uh, I ate so much because the food doesn't have a lot of flavor, so you're just like, ar, 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 you're just eating all the time, and you get fat, and that's what happens. So, you know, side effect to being very pure is you get kind of chubby if you're not careful about what you eat. Rajas, movement, action, excitement, fire. Um, this would be the, so like in a diet, this would be like spices, garlic, onions, meat, um, not processed meats, but like meat. Meat is thought to bring up a lot of emotion. That's why emotion and power and virility. So like kshatriyas are supposed to have meat. Um, they're also supposed to eat garlic and onions and lots of spices in ways that Brahmins aren't supposed to because they're supposed to be a little bit more subtle. Uh, tamas. Uh, I always like to say it's beef sticks and beer. And there's my PBR and my beef sticks and my stones. Torpitude or turpitude, inertia, slowness, they're like rocks, uh, potatoes and PBR, beef sticks. So like what, what you have to do is you just sort of start and when you start reading a lot of Sankhya, you just, you really naturally start parsing out the whole world is when you, oh, I guess that's how they can see that everything is an odd balance of these three qualities. Um, the thing is that, that everybody has these, so there are some balance in there. So like air has buoyance, it's very light. Stones have tamas, it doesn't move. Fire has rajas, but fire also has some sattvas because it has air within it. This is similar to our thinking about the elements in uh, Western thought, but it's not clearly analogous. Um, so with people, I kind of like these, these three pictures here. Think about um, some people are pure, some people are active, some people are torpid. Um, they're sattvic, they're rajasic, or they're tamasic. 
So like a professor is someone who's very sattvic in their purity and dedication to sort of knowledge. But on the other hand, especially if you look at me, we're all, bah! you know, we're all kind of moving and our brains are popping all around and whatnot. And there's also a Thomas quality to it because a professor sits all day and just writes and doesn't move their body. Or what about a race car driver who has clearly got to be very rajasic into movement, but he also has to be tamas to understand how the machine operates. Or a drunk. Yeah, drunks are just tamasic. They're just, they're just pure tamas. Okay, so Ayurveda posits that um, these gunas, rajas, tamas, and sattvas, can, when they're in perfect balance through diet, exercise, and medical treatment, that you can come to a state of overall well-being. I wanted to bring this up because like we have Ayur from Ayus, sort of which means like the life wins, and Veda here you could translate as, as science. You know, there's also that uh, beauty company called Aveda, which sounds like not Veda, which sounds like naive to me, but, <laughs> but it's actually short for Ayurveda, but clearly they didn't talk to any Indians on that one who said, why are you calling it Aveda? That's like calling it false or untruth, or my little joke is always naive. So that's Ayurveda, which uses a lot of these same concepts that you find originally in Sankhya. All right, take a break. We'll come right back. <laughs> 